Hi, I'm, I'm Mark. Um, it's a real thrill to talk to uh, such a learned crowd about, uh, about our work. Uh, you know, there's a relatively small list of authors on this paper, but like any big system in production, it is the work of many, uh, with many contributors uh, and, and, you know, many, many founders. Um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about Firecracker uh, and, uh, and why we built it, what we built, and, and what we use it for, and, and where we see, you know, micro VMs and virtualization going in the future. A uh, brief outline, uh, what is Firecracker? Why did we build it? A little bit of the performance metrics and graphs, because I know uh, you all like that kind of thing, and as, as do I, um, and, uh, and some of the challenges of the future, for the future, and uh, you know, why I'm excited about this stuff. So super high level, Firecracker is an open source VMM, and if you don't know what that word means, I'll explain in a second, that is purpose built for, uh, for creating and managing secure multi-tenant container and function services. Uh, and we'll step into each of those uh, as we go, uh, because all of them are very important. Uh, and in specifically, uh, you know, we think Firecracker is generally useful. We're excited about community uptake. But down in our own deployments, multi-tenant container, we mean our product called Fargate, which is a serverless container service. And function-based, we mean AWS Lambda, which is our uh, you know, fun serverless function as a service uh, system. So let's talk about how a VMM fits in. Now, there are many ways to cut virtualization. There have been many architectures for this over time. Uh, and this is the one that, uh, that we chose. Uh, so the dotted box here is what we call a micro VM. I'll talk a little bit about what makes it micro in a second. Uh, and its relationship with, uh, with the host, which is outside the, uh, outside the box. Uh, KVM is uh, the kernel virtual machine. is a standard feature of the Linux kernel. Uh, and what KVM does is uh, provide an abstraction over uh, hardware virtualization features in, in, in various uh, processors and uh, handles some of the sort of low-level virtualization stuff like wrangling page tables and so on. Um, I.O. and the setup of KVM and all of the sort of higher functions are handled by a VMM process. And this is a totally normal Linux process running in the host. So you can go onto that host, you can run PS and top, and you can see that program uh, running. And so this talk is about Firecracker, which is that component. It handles I.O., it handles setup, uh, it handles device emulation, and a couple of other you know, very important pieces of, uh, of the virtualization story. So a little Firecracker background. Uh, we started with a project called, from Google called CrossVM, um, part, uh, part of their Chrome OS project, uh, and, uh, and removed about half the code. Uh, so we branched off there and took out a whole bunch of stuff that we don't need uh, because we are specializing for a relatively small set of use cases. Uh, and then we built in, we added a whole lot of things of our own. Um, you know, we did some performance work, we did some more device emulation work, we did some kernel loading work, uh, we did, uh, did some re-architecture of the code base and ended up with our initial version of Firecracker. Um, and to put a number on, uh, on, on the smallness of that, that's about 4% of the size of QMU, which often plays this role of VMM uh, in the KVM ecosystem. It's a bit of an apples to oranges comparison, so forgive me, uh, but it'll give you an idea of, you know, it's small, it's relatively focused, and it doesn't try and do all of the many, many things that something like QMU does. What makes these uh, VMs micro is they have a really simplified device model. There's no BIOS. Uh, there's no PCI, there's no USB, there's no video. You know, we've just ripped all of that stuff out. We boot a kernel with, uh, there's a serial device, uh, there's a keyboard controller, or a little stub of a keyboard controller, uh, and then there are a couple of, uh, of Vert.io devices, network and block and vSocket. Uh, and that's it, as device model goes. Uh, and, so, uh, and so the device model is vastly simpler than the kind of device model that you would need to boot a full operating system if you wanted to like boot Windows or something. Um, but that lets us again be focused both in the, in the VMM itself and in the kernel that we build for it. That kernel is, is very small and very minimal. Uh, Firecracker supports Linux uh, guests and uh, the OSV microkernel right now. Um, it would be fairly easy to port something like the BSD, various BSD kernels to it. Uh, and quite difficult to port um, a lot of bigger operating system kernels. 
We've been excited to work with the container community to do some integration with, uh, with the container ecosystem, Carter containers, container D, and so on. And so you can uh, install a lot of this stuff and sort of pick up Firecracker as an alternative to Linux container isolation. Um, Firecracker is also open source. You can go get it on GitHub. Uh, we have an open roadmap. Uh, we work closely with the community, and it's all Apache 2 licensed. We've been using uh, Firecracker in production since 2008 uh, in, uh, in AWS Lambda and a couple of other places in AWS. We run millions of concurrent different workloads, arbitrary pieces of code that our customers bring us inside these micro VMs um, and do that all, you know, all concurrently around the world. Um, this brag stat, trillions of requests a month, is a little bit old, it's many trillions, and that comes out to kind of uh, tens-ish of millions requests per second. Uh, so my team often jokes that we've started more VMs than anyone else in the world uh, in total. Um, so why Firecracker? Why did we do this? Um, well, our core problem is multi-tenancy, or our core opportunity is multi-tenancy. Uh, so we have this big circle, right? This is an EC2 M5 metal instance. It's a pretty normal piece of hardware. There's nothing crazy going on here. Um, 384 gigs of RAM, 48 cores, and so on. The smallest Lambda function, on the other hand, is 128 megabytes. So I can't go out, and I mean, I can, but I don't want to go out and buy a 128 megabyte of RAM server. Uh, instead, what I want to do is I want to take the 384 gigabyte of RAM server, which is a nice kind of current sweet spot in my economics curve, and I want to pack thousands, and in this case, about 3,000 or slightly more because, uh, uh, because of, of, of soft, uh, soft provisioning uh, into a machine. So what are the requirements for doing that? The most important requirement is isolation. It must be safe for multiple functions or multiple workloads to run on the same hardware. And here the word safe is doing a lot of work. Um, what we mean is uh, there should be no path to privilege escalation. These workloads shouldn't be able to go from being unprivileged to being privileged uh, no matter what kind of evil they try and do uh, by themselves. Um, there should be no path to information disclosure. You know, there shouldn't be one guest that can read the memory or the I.O. or even infer anything about the memory or the I.O. or the state of any other guest. And that's super, super important uh, to the protection of data in the cloud. And finally, and perhaps most subtly, there shouldn't be any way to create covert channels. So even two cooperating VMs shouldn't be able to transfer state between them. And this matters because we want uh, our customers to be able to use our kind of declarative authorization features rather than, uh, you know, not have to worry about covert channels between even cooperating pieces of code. A couple of other operational properties we want. Uh, very little overhead and high density, right? I'm running thousands of these things on a machine, so I want little overhead. With Firecracker, we achieve something about the order of about five megabytes of uh, of overhead per VMM uh, with, uh, with the Firecracker VMM and the minified uh, guest kernel. Um, performance, functions must perform similarly to running natively. I don't want to walk away from a bunch of performance. Low performance doesn't only mean low performance, it generally also means high CPU utilization in doing things like I.O. And I don't want that because I want to sell that CPU to my customers so they can have a great time running on my platforms. Um, and then compatibility. I don't want to make trade-offs where I say to people, oh, no, you can't bring binaries, or you can't use that kernel API, or you can't use these syscalls. Um, and, uh, and so we wanted to be able to tell people, you can use the whole surface area of Linux, you can use the whole feature set there without any changes or recompilation. Uh, and this is a big driver of the decision to use virtualization. And then finally, we need soft allocation, right? We need to be able to, uh, if a VM doesn't use all of the memory that's allocated to it, or all of the CPU that's allocated to it, we want to be able to, uh, you know, allocate to it what it uses and, uh, and share the rest among the whole group. So there shouldn't need to be hard allocation, which is, uh, is something that comes up in virtualization a whole lot. Uh, and by the way, soft allocation and isolation are a particularly challenging set of requirements uh, to go together. So we built Firecracker to tick all of these boxes. Um, and there's a little bit of a quick comparison. There's a huge amount of depth here. Um, so let me go quickly around why we didn't use some of the other stuff here. Um, 
QMU KVM is kind of the obvious candidate in the virtualization space. Uh, we couldn't achieve the density we wanted. Uh, the, K, the, the, the QMU team has actually done some really awesome work since we released Firecracker on improving their density. I'm very excited about that. Um, and there was also some overhead that we, uh, that we didn't like there. Uh, Linux containers, and this might be the controversial one, so I'm going to be careful what I say here, because if you're a security person, you know the hairs might be rising on the back of your neck right now. Um, Linux containers have isolation challenges, which I won't go into, uh, but the most important one here is compatibility challenges. A lot of the security story around Linux containers is about reducing the surface area of the host kernel through mechanisms like seccomp. And if you reduce the surface area of the host kernel, you're going to break customer code. Uh, and uh, and that's, a, uh, that's a problem we didn't want to have to make those trade-offs. Uh, LibOS approaches, very, very interesting. You know, lots of great research over the years. Uh, some, of, uh, you know, some of the other cloud providers have gone in this direction. But there's some real compatibility challenges there, which I'll talk to a little bit later in the talk. Uh, and then language VM isolation, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, like V8 isolates and, and uh, Java security managers and so on. Uh, again, good stuff, but uh, the compatibility challenges, generally you can't bring binaries, and isolation challenges. That stuff is, uh, is pretty scary in a, uh, you know, specterful world. Um, let's look at some of our performance numbers. Uh, boot time is, uh, is a key one. You'll see that there are two traces for Firecracker here, uh, Firecracker and Firecracker pre uh, we have two ways of configuring a Firecracker. One is with a kind of post-startup API call, uh, and the other is with a bunch of command line arguments. So Firecracker pre is the bunch of command line arguments. And here, one of the comparisons is Cloud HV. Uh, this is a product from Intel, um, which uh, is related to Firecracker and has used, uh, you know, shared some of the code. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, excited about the ecosystem that's building around this stuff. Uh, and so much, much faster than QMU on boot. Uh, and uh, a nice vertical curve there on the CDF. There's not, uh, there's not a whole lot of tail latency here uh, in the serial launches. But even more importantly, when we go to launching 50 parallel micro VMs, this is 50 parallel micro VMs on a 48 core box, um, and this is all of them starting up at the same time, you can see that, uh, that QMU and, and to an extent the, the non-pre version of Firecracker really spread out in time. We get a whole lot of outliers. Um, but the Firecracker Pre, uh, which is kind of optimized for this case, optimized to drive down contention, uh, keeps a really nice kind of vertical CDF. So we don't get a lot of outlier latency in startups, uh, which is important to us. Now we get to talk trade-offs. Uh, this is QDEP1 IO latency. So there's the IO latency that matters for, uh, for things that are kind of doing a serial stream of IO. IO wait, IO wait, IO wait. Um, and you can see that we actually do pretty well here uh, with Firecracker. Uh, there, there are some opportunities to improve things. Uh, but 4K read, you can see we're down in the, uh, um, you know, low, uh, you know, low sort of 200, between 200 and 100 microseconds. Uh, and 4K write, we're down there. Um, uh, and, and so this is pretty good. Uh, there's some uh, throughput limitation, which you can see in the bigger block sizes. But we're quite happy with this as a, as a starting point. The place we're not super happy with our current I.O. implementation is on throughput. So this is QDEP32. Uh, generally, this would be like something offering a big workload um, and hoping that the underlying platform will be able to parallelize that work. And one of the cool things about Flash is that it's great at parallelizing work. So we do that. Uh, and this is a place where QMU uh, just completely destroys us. Um, and, uh, you know, this is called operational, uh, you know, there's a track about operational lessons. One operational lesson is you never get the time to build exactly what you want to build. Uh, so I'd love to go back and do this with, like, IOU ring and a new kernel, and we can get to some really great performance here. Um, so a couple of operational lessons as we go. Uh, compatibility is really hard. Um, it doesn't seem hard because it's easy to get to 95%, uh, but that large 5% is very, very tough. Uh, so just disabling hyperthreading, so just switching from a hyperthreaded box to a box without SMT uh, revealed two bugs in, in a, a you know, well, widely used piece of Apache code uh, and a couple of bugs in our own code. And that's the kind of compatibility thing that happens as soon as you start fiddling with the, you know, underneath the system. Um, 
as we've gone through our, our compatibility challenges, we're pretty sure that re-implementing OS components would have been way worse here, uh, especially on performance, especially on these sort of edge cases of compatibility. There's a great debate to have with some other folks, um, but being bug compatible with something as big as the Linux kernel uh, is real hard, especially being performance bug compatible. Um, good, good work there. Um, one of the, uh, the things that we do super heavily uh, and believe in really heavily is immutable time-limited machines. Our whole fleet of, of Firecracker workers, um, no box in there ever gets changed after it gets into production, and no box in there ever lives for longer than about eight hours. Um, and the reason we do that is so we can be sure exactly which bits are on our, on our, are on our production fleet, and even if they're bugs, they continuously kind of get cycled out and cleaned up and replaced with the cleanest software. And we do this because systems management stuff tends to be non-deterministic. So if you're going and changing things in prod, you end up with fleet divergence, where you end up with different software sets running on every box in your fleet, and we can measure that. Uh, I don't have data to share, unfortunately, but it really happens. Um, oh, and operational hygiene is just super important to, uh, to simplicity. And then finally, the job is never done. Um, our security colleagues have done a great job keeping us on our toes here uh, with regards to isolation. Um, customers have done a great job keeping us on our toes with regards to performance uh, and compatibility. And so virtualization and any kind of system like this isn't a product, it's, it's an operational life cycle. It's not something you can just get from GitHub and install and be done. It's something you're doing every day, you're investing in every day, and you're trying to improve every day. And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's, that's something that you know, we see as a big benefit of working you know, in, in concert with, with a larger community. So in the last minute here, uh, some of the opportunities we think uh, around the micro VM space. Uh, so in our uh, infrastructure products like EC2, we do a lot of hardware offload with our Nitro system, where the whole I.O. path uh, is done in hardware with, uh, with specialized offload. Um, we don't currently do that in micro VMs, and uh, there's some really interesting challenges in getting there, and I, you know, that, as far as I'm concerned, is the gold standard of performance. Uh, scheduling these super dense sets of micro VMs is, uh, is tough, uh, especially if you care about tail latency and driving up utilization, and I think there's some great algorithms work, great scheduler work, and so on to be done there, both in industry and in research. Um, we would love to see more formal correctness work done in this space um, of, uh, of all kinds of virtualization and hardware and so on. Um, more features, and then we have Rust VMM, which is a project we're doing together with the community uh, with VMMs and containers where we're inviting people to pick up a toolkit uh, and, and build specialized VMMs of their own. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. That's a lot of talking. Questions? Okay, there's one come. Oh. Go for it. Hey, hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what kind of properties do you want to uh, formally verify? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, pretty much everything. You know, I've mostly around that isolation boundary, the correctness of, uh, of the things like uh, VertIO implementations. We've made some good starts there. Um, you know, some uh, optimality around. Uh, um, or, or, you know, properties around scheduling. I think, uh, you know, it's a big question, uh, yeah. and, uh, and maybe we should chat about it afterwards, but, you know, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity there in, in various places. Thank you. Hi, David Liu from Princeton. Uh, thanks for sharing your experience. Uh, you mentioned that providing proper isolation in a multi-tenant environment is the main driver, so could you say more about, like, in particular, what kind of, like, cover channel protection that, uh, that your system is providing? Uh, yeah, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a whole talk of its own. Um, if you go and look in the GitHub repo in documentation, there's a list of, uh, or partial list of the mitigations that we think are best practice. Uh, these days that comes down to flushing L1, flushing as much of the micro architecture as you can, not sharing pages, not denuping pages, not compressing things. Uh, it's a pretty long laundry list. So if you're interested, again, happy to, happy to talk afterwards. Thank you. Hi, right, Rick Farrow. So, um, in the paper, you mentioned that you have a stripped-down Linux kernel that you're running inside the container. How big is that? I don't know offhand. Uh, ah, okay. It's kind of configured down. Um, 
I right. Get some numbers for you. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll talk outside. Yeah. Thanks, Mark.